Uh, welcome back. Hello to everyone in the room. Hello to everyone on the live stream. Uh, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation and Princeton University, it's my pleasure to welcome Marcus Mobius here to the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. Uh, one of the goals of this institute is to bring together social scientists and data scientists to jointly advance the field. And we're very excited to have Marcus here because he is doing this all within himself. He is both now a social scientist and a data scientist, so he's trained as an economist. Now he's working at Microsoft Research in the New England lab. He's been there for several years, and he's picked up a lot of, um, been able to, in a very creative and interesting way, combine ideas from economics with a lot of the new sources of data that are available now. Um, and Marcus does this both with sort of observational studies as well as through field experiments. So we are very happy to have him here today. And thank you, Marcus. Thanks a lot, Matt. OK, so I'm, um, I thought I'm going to start talking about a specific project, um, this impact of aggregators on internet news consumption. Uh, this is joined with uh, Susan Athey at Stanford and Jeno Paul, who is at the CEU in Budapest, and he has also been um, an intern twice at um, MSR New England. And um, so I, I chose this project because uh, I wanted to first like, you know, talk about that because it's, it's quite specific. Uh, but you see that we used a bunch of techniques and tools we developed in order to write this paper. And I'm going to talk about those at the end and also about some ongoing projects. Also thought like you know this is actually um, you know if you're interested in working with Microsoft data uh, and you know you might find some interesting data sources there because uh, uh, we have access to browsing data through Internet Explorer and uh, some other some other data sets which you might might find useful for this. Okay, so let me tell you about this specific uh, project. Um, you know. Uh, Probably doesn't come as a surprise to you, but but news consumption is moving online. Uh, so you see here, um, you know, any digital news. So this starts. This is from the Pew survey. Uh, but you know, uh, news reading on TV, radio is going down, but digital reading is going up. Okay. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for the for the newspapers, um, this was terrible for their business model. In some sense, sort of it mirrors what happens to the music industry. But uh, if you look here, again, this is, these are numbers from Pew from between 2003 and 2014, you see uh, pretty much a collapse in the print ad revenue. Okay? And it's true that digital advertising is increasing, but it's no way making up. Okay? And this is not, a, not just a phenomenon in the US, this is, this is in uh, most parts of the world. And you know, for the ad, for the newspaper industry, this has been a tremendous problem. Uh, newspapers are closing, uh, so you don't see that as much um, in uh, total daily uh, newsprint. I mean, it has been more gradual, but newspaper 100 million, you see this is this decline, and this is something that has accelerated in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, newsroom employment has has decreased. Again, this is something that. Uh, sort of decrease a lot around the time of the of the Great Depression, uh, the last the last big depression, and um, you know why why has this happened? And uh, you know one sort of popular theory is that internet made it easier to share the content, um, and a particular contentious topic here are the aggregators. Okay. Um, and I want to distinguish here between, I want to focus here on pure aggregators. Pure aggregators are um, Google News, for example, that do, they, they, do, they do not produce any original content. Um, but instead, they curate algorithms, mostly through, uh, they, they curate articles, mostly through algorithms, and then present the news snippets. And um, you, know, you can then click to visit the article on the original page, right? So, uh, so this, you know, they're contentious because um, newspaper, newspapers essentially believe that they are substitutes for newspaper reading. So what they do is they, you know, newspapers accuse aggregators of stealing essentially page views um, so that um, 
uh, because the aggregate landing pages look similar to the news outlets. It looks like a real newspaper. If you look again here, you know, they're basically accusing them that, you know, I go to Google News, I just look at Google News, and then I don't have to go to the actual newspaper. Just read the snippets and that's it. Okay? Um, you know, obviously aggregators have, uh, have a different opinion on this. For them, you know, they think they are, they are complements. So they think, but basically they are like taxis driving news readers uh, to the restaurants, in this case the, the, the news articles. Okay? So they make discovery easier. There's lower transaction costs of finding news outlets. So they're great. Okay? And whatever crisis the newspaper industry is in would be even bigger if it weren't for the aggregators. Okay? So these are sort of very stark, two stark views. And sort of that's, you know, social scientists, that's nice because economists, that's nice because you know, this is something we potentially can answer with data. Okay? So uh, in the European Union, there has been a lot of regulatory action about this. Uh, so the earliest country passing uh, a law was New Germany. They passed a copyright law in 2013. Uh, newspapers could decide how much to charge aggregators for displaying new snippets. So previously, prior to this law, new snippets could be uh, could be shown without without uh, you know for free, but now basically newspapers uh, could demand payment. However, they didn't have to; they could give a free license. And so what what Google what Google did is they said we're only going to include you, continue to include you in our index if you give us a free license. And all the biggest uh, newspapers just said sure, and so it went away. Actually, it did have an effect on smaller aggregators, which did have to pay. But Google News in particular didn't have to. Okay? Uh, otherwise, you just, you just flew, I mean, you, you were just removed from the internet. Uh, now, Spain, uh, two years later, they tried to be much smarter. And so what they did is they uh, passed a law which otherwise was similar. But in this case, you know, the Newspaper Association of Spain, which basically sort of a super organization where every newspaper is a member of, they are the only ones who can negotiate those fees. Okay? So it wasn't possible to give a free license. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't give a free license to Google or Yahoo or Bing. You had to go through this uh, monopsonist, so this, through the single seller. And well, what Google there did is they shut down the service entirely. And Yahoo and Bing did the same thing. Okay? So if you now go to like Google News Spain, there's a message saying that because of this law, you know, we cannot show any news. Now, uh, this was only for the, for the standard Google News. So they still show the, the search box. So if you, if you look, for example, for Donald Trump, you know, on standard Google, Google search, you know, there's going to be a search box which shows a bunch of articles. So these articles remained because interpretation of the law, you know, you know seemed to exclude those, um, which is important because actually the majority of the algorithmically filtered news is, is accessed that way. Okay, and um, now there is a, you know, this is the old digital commissioner, this is a new one. Um, there's a new EU directive, and they basically sort of try to um, impose a similar law, you know. It's sort of a hybrid between the German and the, and the Spanish law, and that's in, currently being discussed. So this is, um, you know, so here just like, you know, some, some, some newspaper reports sort of, uh, illustrating those two views. Um, you know, this is, this is a newspaper article from February about um, political, uh, about the pr proposed EU directive. And you can see here that, you know, the opponents of the plan are particularly the smaller publishers. Okay, which was interesting because it was... Um, it was also in Spain the case that the larger publishers were the ones pushing this. The smaller publishers were concerned about discovery. They were concerned that they would lose out under this plan. Okay? And you will see in our results that this is exactly what happened. Um, on the other hand, you know, the EU itself, you know, they did a survey. They asked people, um, you know, do you, do you go, do you actually read the article after you see it on Google News or an aggregator? And, you know, half of them say they don't. And so, this was heavily cited in this EU directive as a justification of why, um, uh, you know, why this is a good idea. Okay. Um, all right. So what we're trying to do here is like we use um, the shutdown of Google News in Spain as a natural experiment. Uh, we have 
from Internet Explorer, we have a browsing data set of newsreaders in Spain. We have those guys who read Google News, and we match them to a synthetic control of the non-Google News readers, who otherwise are similar in every respect, okay? Yeah, so we have Google News users and non-Google News users. Um, and then we compare overall news consumption pre-shutdown. Uh, uh, pre um, and so just to give you sort of a, a, a preview of the results, you know, basically what we find is we find fairly strong support for this complements view. Um, that uh, if you remove Google News, uh, you uh, reduce traffic to news publishers by about 10%. Okay? And this is entirely driven by the small publishers. So for the large publishers, it's roughly a wash. Basically, what happens for the large publishers, it's a reallocation from landing pages. So if Google News is removed, they have fewer articles, but more landing pages. And then it sort of depends, one second, then it depends like, you know, how you, how you value ad revenue on landing pages or article pages. Okay? Yeah. So just trying to understand the strategy. Um, what? How does it affect your identification strategy that uh, the, the Spanish law was different than these other laws, right? Because the other laws, the Spanish law did not give an opt-out option. Oh, uh, all we are using is basically that uh, Google News shuts down on December 16, 2014. Are you comparing it to the other states that tried it out? No, 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 no. no. We, we do it... But in this kind of control, are you... Yeah, so, so essentially we, we compare, states? you know, we have a bunch of users who use Google News and a bunch of users who didn't. And then, you know, afterwards, they all don't use Google News, right? Yeah. Because there's no more Google yeah, News, yeah, yeah. right? And so we see how their relative consumption was impacted by the shutdown. Okay. And we can do that because we have, for every user, <coughs> very, very detailed data on their actual consumption pattern, okay? So other papers have used, for example, outlet, you know, publisher-level data. So that it wouldn't be possible to do that. But here we can follow specific users, and we can see the impact it has, this event has, on their on their on their consumption behavior. Okay. Um, hopefully, it will be clearer in two slides because I'll show you the identification strategy. Because there are a couple of things which are a bit unusual. Um, so related work: there are two papers. Um, so an older paper by Shu and Tucker. Um, so they used uh, a different natural experiment where Google News in around 2009 or 2010 removed AP content for several weeks because of a uh, contact dispute, contract dispute. Yahoo News was used as a control, okay? And then they looked at visits to AP related articles, you know, on Google and, and Yahoo. Um, and they also found support for the, for the compliments. And then the most closely related paper is Calzada and Gill. Um, so they also use exactly the same event, the shutdown of Google News in Spain, um, but they use as a control consumption in France. Okay, so they use a different country, uh, and that's because you know they have um, uh, they have uh, publisher level data. Okay, so here is the empirical strategy. So let me just, in terms of to clarify methodology. There's something we call pre-shutdown, then there's adjustment and matching. So pre-shutdown is, is before December 16th. Uh, everything is, is, you know, there's Google News around. Here, Google News shut down. Then we allow, allow a couple of weeks of adjustment. We gave them about three weeks. And then uh, there's this pause period. And actually, and this is somewhat unusual, we do the matching here. So what we do is we match the former Google News users and the non-Google News users, those who never use Google News, we match them here at this, page, at this, at this stage. And so why do we do that? So um, because, you know, it's almost like, you know, we're reversing time. You know, usually you do the matching in the pre-period and then time flows this way, right? Um, you know, so unfortunately for us, you know, what, what we observed was Google News being removed, um, not Google News being added, right? And, um, um, you know, the, the problem we had is like, you know, we, we started with matching before, but I mean, the matching before is really not so meaningful because essentially what you're doing is you're matching Google News users and non-Google News users. And, you know, what do you match them on? Say you match them on their total consumption, but these are different technologies, right? If you think, for example, the aggregators are more or less efficient in finding certain, certain discovery, you know, this is not a meaningful exercise because you're matching essentially on a conglomerate between, like, you know, preferences and uh, technology, okay? So what we did instead was we did the matching ex post, okay? So we have, we have uh, former Google News users and those who never use Google News. And 
for every former Google News user, we essentially find a control user who, after the shutdown, behaves exactly the same. It's the same amount of Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and so on. Okay? Right? And so we argue that basically this treatment user and the synthetic control user, they essentially should have similar preferences because you know, they have access to the same technology and they behave the same way. Okay? So that's the, that's the exercise we're doing. So your claim in reversing what would normally have been like a, you know, a pre-matching is that any kind of psychological effect of Google News being shut down is taken into account in the adjustment period. Yes. So it's post that. But, yes, that's right. But could you imagine that having used Google News I don't think I have a really well formulated question here, but maybe like they they found different sources of news or something like that, and and they they maintain those different sources afterwards in a way that they wouldn't have if they never had access to Google News. Yeah. So good. So the okay. I mean, the thing is that you know, um, so Google News is sort of it's 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 hard. To, I mean, first of all, like afterwards, all the all the aggregators were gone. You know, um, so it wasn't just like you know, but, but also like Google News is, in terms of quality, Google News is such is it, it's hard to replace. You know, because especially for Spanish language uh, in Spain, I mean Google News gave very good coverage. Uh, I mean, according to most accounts, Yahoo and uh, uh, Bing weren't quite there. It's not like in the U.S. where Bing News is sort of a, a closer substitute to that. Um, you know, I'm not claiming that Google News users are the Google. I mean, clearly the Google News users. I mean, we we, we didn't have like you know variables like education and so on, but clearly they they are very different from the non Google users Google News users overall. What we just trying to argue is that by matching their consumption afterwards, you know, on news sources, total news consumption, etc., topics, you know, we should have essentially we should basically control for the. Let's say that you know Google News users are more educated. So the matching should take care of that. And I can show you, so I show you, I will show you data. We only match on a couple of dimensions, but then I show you other match other dimensions we could have matched on, we didn't match on, but actually our users are very close on those dimensions as well. I'm gonna show that to you. Okay? So um right. Was another question? Yeah. I guess um what if some of the dimensions are actually a direct result of the treatment of losing uh, Google News, then would the covariate that you match on be on the causal pathway or be posted? Okay, give me an example maybe. Um, uh, that, I mean, I, I can start with whatever you actually match on, but just the idea is this whole, whole post treatment bias or like. By doing this type of matching, do you ha actually have to redefine what exactly your treatment is in this? So, right, I. You know, I, th I think you know. So this is something we, we you know, we, we. So I mean. If you give me a specific story, Let's maybe, say maybe like we can... time, just time spent reading the news, like yes. very hypothetically. Yeah. And as, as a direct result of not, if I'm in the treatment group and now without Google News, as a result of that, I just spend less time um, reading the news now. And then now you're finding me a control after I lose. Right. Um, right? But the, actually the fact that I... So that I guess I guess we would argue in this case, you know, this is something that I mean, our argument maybe should be something taking care of the adjustment. You know, I mean, maybe after I mean, actually, our our if you compare the match users doing the adjustment, they're very close as well. Okay, but but I guess what we what we would argue is that anything happening during the adjustment should take care of this, <coughs> of you know, because maybe maybe for a while you're not used to reading news anymore, right? So your direct news consumption plummets. And then sort of it picks up again, but you know what we need to argue for this to work is that after a bunch of weeks, you know, they go, you know, they are sort of again in a stable state, and basically their news reading is sort of reflecting what they would have done, you know, if Google News would never have existed. Um, I mean, you know, I should say like you know the average news consumption of Google News is about sort of twenty percent, twenty-five percent. 
so it's not like you know that, that these Google News users read Google News exclusively. I mean, they they read it, but it's 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 uh, for many of them it's more like you know you read five six newspapers, one of them is closing. And uh, you know you reallocate. I would be more worried about this if this would be, for example, users who like you know have 80, 90 percent of their consumption from Google News. Mm, I guess an extreme case would be if the if all the effect of this treatment as it defined now is whatever the users did during the adjustment period, then if you do the matching after the adjustment period, you wouldn't have seen any result whatever outcome you're looking at, right? Like as it's hypothetically an extreme case. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if I could have reversed time, you know, it would have been great. <laughs> I mean, given, given that the, this was sort of the constraint we had to live with, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think our matching made sense and definitely we think it makes much more sense than doing it pre-shutdown. Pre because mm -hmm. pre-shutdown, you just, you know, you match those guys, but you're really matching them on the sort of mixture of technology and, and you know, and preferences. Mm -hmm. You know, at least if you do it here, you know, you can argue that the technology is the same, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you are kind of equalizing, equalizing, uh, equalizing the, the preferences of the treatment and control users. Just yes. a clarifying question. Um, mm -hmm. Why uh, uh, are you matching on technology? Don't the users and non-users have access, both have access to the same technology? They, it's just that the, the user needs the technology and the non-users don't need the technology? Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so you're totally right. And so, you know, you, you argue then, like, you know, why did these users before use, some of them use Google News and why some didn't, right? And so the story would there be like, you know, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain hazard function. You know, there's a certain probability that in each period you transit from, like, you know, not using the aggregator to using aggregator, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably that's related, you know, that's increasing at your education level, how much you like news, etc. right? <coughs> but... Um, you know, the matching here, right, is basically equalizing people who are similar news consumption, read similar newspaper at similar intensity, right? And so the, uh, you know, our argument is essentially that matching should take care of all those things, you know, which made you, which made you, uh, which made you adopt Google News at a higher rate earlier on, right? So clearly if you, if you look at all the non-Google News users and all the Google News users, they're vastly different, right? But after the matching, they're very similar. And I'm going to show you lots of statistics beyond the matched ones to like, you know, convince you that basically these guys are very, very similar on all these other dimensions as well. Okay? So, I, you know, so because we actually match them in only like, you know, five, six dimensions, but I'm going to show you like, you know, many more of those. And, you know, they're actually very, very close in all of those. Okay? Good. Okay, so I described that to you. Um, so we okay, so we, we identify the Google News users here, and then uh, we find the control users during the matching period. Uh, and then, sort of the thought exercise we do is we essentially, you know, to look at the impact of Google News versus non-Google News. If we can argue that these control and treatment users have the same preferences, all we have to do is basically look at the pre-shutdown period and just compare the consumption of the non-Google News users with the Google News users, right? That sort of gives us the, the comparison, right? So, um, so once, we, once we equalize the preferences here, you know, we can compare them directly here in the pre-shutdown period. Yeah? You might have said this earlier, but did, did any of the news sites respond or change their way of showing news when Google News shut down? Uh, we weren't aware of that, so we, we, we did a, you know we didn't we didn't scrape newspapers at the time, so we actually now scrape every day all the European newspapers, including Spain. But we started that after this, you know, after this data had already been collected, so we don't have any 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 uh, evidence. But the thing is, like, um, it happened sort of it came as a surprise. Nobody expected Google News to shut down, you know, because they hadn't even started yet negotiating with this association. You know, okay. The law wasn't even formally in effect yet. But, uh, you know, they just said, like, you know, you know screw it, you're not going to deal with it, and they just uh, shut down. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, hypothetically, in the adjustment period, the news agencies could have responded in some way, but it sounds like they. No, I, I think it, it came like that, you know, maybe the ultimate outcome that they would withdraw wasn't a surprise, but they would do it so soon was sort of a surprise. So I don't think they could have responded. Most people were surprised. Yeah, was that a question? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it was in the horizon of, of your study, but a bunch of the smaller uh, guys uh, started trying to recover the lost traffic through paid search through Google, which is kind of sad. Yeah, so I mean, they used to be getting this free traffic, but the government shut it down, and 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 they had actually actually had to pay Google. I mean, Google probably earned more through that ad revenue well, that's than they yeah. did under you know by having Google I mean, News. I can show you the numbers. I mean, they they even though they did like you know they didn't you know this wasn't this didn't make up for the traffic sure. they lost. So um, you know, I mean, we don't have that in our data, but to the extent that happened, you know, it would actually. Uh, no, it's like you know our estimate of the of the decrease is conservative. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you sort of a simple model of news consumption, and you know it's really, I mean, it, it really helped us basically. Like once we sort of had developed this, you know, had developed this model, a lot of things for us were clearer, and um, it also like motivates sort of the functional form in in our analysis. But it's it's really very basic and very simple. Uh, so. Um, so it's basically like, you know, the idea here is as a consumer, uh, you can allocate um, his time or her time between reading news and doing other stuff, okay? And um, when he or she reads news, um, you know, they can read news of a, of a certain type C, where C is sort of a vector of characteristics. And it could be like, you know, breaking news, is it a popular news topic, etc. okay? <coughs> So think of C, the characteristic is basically a vector of things, right? Different types of news. Um, and N is the total, you know, sort of the, the article, the number of articles they read. So user I reads um, N pages of uh, type C at time T, okay? And this alpha thing is just uh, sort of how much, you know, the, the weight they put on this type of news consumption. And L is just leisure, other stuff they do. Yeah. Going kayaking, you know, doing other things. So this would be this. And, um, you know, there is, uh, this, these tau's are basically time specific and, and you know, so, so tau i would be how much that particular user values news versus other activities, okay? So basically a news hound would have a high tau i and somebody who doesn't like news at all would have a low tau i, okay? And these tau t's are things which vary over time, so that would be, uh, you know, if you have, you know, Donald Trump is being elected, you know, this is sort of a big event, you know, people read a lot of news, okay? Uh, it's Christmas, you know, people have, don't have time, they don't spend time with their families or some other holiday, and then this tau is low, okay? Yeah? So these are seasonal shocks, and then how much, how much of a news hound you are. And this alpha is, is, is then capturing whether you like science news or whether you like breaking news, right? what, kind of, what kind of news you like. Okay? So that's, the, um, you know, that's, that's your utility function. And so if you look at this, I mean, this is sort of the simplest utility function you can, you can write down. It's just a Cobb Douglas utility function. Okay? And, um, you know. One nice thing about this is that we know in, in the in top darkness utility function, it just means that you know these alphas are basically users will spend a share tau t tau i on news cons on consuming news. So if they have a total time allotment of 24 hours, you know this is a share. This is the share they spend on reading news, and then within the news they consume, this is the amount of time is spent on consuming news of a particular type, okay? Yeah? So it's a very, it's a very simple, um, it's a very simple utility function. Um, okay? Now, so every, every model of consumption, you know, you need a, uh, you need demand, but then you need also a production function or technology, right? So in this case, uh, there are two technologies available. One is reading without the aggregator and reading with the aggregator, okay? And so what we assume here is that um, 
you know, for each news type C, uh, the user can navigate to articles or home pages to find this news. And basically, if you don't use an aggregator, if you want to find uh, the search or direct navigation or whatever technology you have available, if you want to find news of type C, then, uh, you know, you're going to, like, uncover in one time unit pi. This is how many articles you uncover through direct navigation, through search, and here through social, Facebook, and so on, okay? And so an important assumption here is that those sort of their, you know, economists will call this constant returns to scale. So that means if you spend double the time, you, you uncover double the amount of articles, right? If you go through your, you know, Facebook newsfeed twice as long, you, you uncover twice as many articles. Okay. So your total, the total news you consume in one time period is basically the directly navigated, the search, and the social news. So this is all the all the news you navigate, and so here the key assumption is uh, it's really this constant returns to scale. So what makes this sort of model tractable is that you know the the news discovery has constant returns to scale, and you know the demand model is a cobb darkness model. And if you put both things together, you have an extremely simple simple model that you can solve. Okay. If they're increasing returns to scales, then uh, you know these models become much much harder. Um, and you know there could be you know there could be here increasing returns to scales because for example like aggregators might become more you know the more heavily you use them they become more effective right? because they can sort of better predict what kind of stuff you're interested in um, okay so the um, okay now what happens in news discovery without aggregators so it's very very similar I mean sorry with aggregators it's very, very similar, except that, you know, now you have this other way of defining news, which is through the aggregator, okay? And I just, you know, put all, you know, over these pi variables, I put a tilde because, um, you know, now when you spend one unit of time with the aggregator finding news, um, you know, and some, of the, some of the news you're going to uncover of type C is going to be through reading <coughs> articles through Google News, okay? Rather than through search or direct navigation, okay? And, um, you know, the assumption we are making here is that the, that the news you read through, uh, that the aggregator is at least as efficient in discovering news as is um, uh, the technology without the aggregator, okay? <coughs> so if you want to find, for example, news on a particular topic, if you use the aggregator, you won't ever do worse, okay? Than if you use the, uh, you know, than if you don't use the aggregator. Now, um, so in this context here, like, you know, aggregators are substitute complements depending on whether the, uh, so even though you never do worse, newspapers might still get fewer articles. And that's because, you know, you can read some of the news through the Google News homepage. Okay? So uh, it's still possible that you consume more news, but actually fewer articles are consumed through the newspapers because you know you you can just uh, um, you can just uh, you can just consume it through the aggregator. Okay. So substitute of complements depends on whether um, uh, you read more articles or fewer articles through aggregators compared to non-aggregators. Okay. So you put all of this together. And then basically, um, you know, here comes out the demand. So the number of the number of pages you uh, you consume is basically uh, a function of how much of a news hound you are, okay, of seasonal effects, how much you care about this particular type of news, okay, and here is how efficient your technology is in discovering this kind of news, okay. So this is a technological parameter. And this is coming from preferences here, okay? Yeah? All right? So for example, you know, Matt says a news hound, he has a high tau I, you know, it's not, it's not a holiday, okay? So there's a lot of time to read news. Uh, he really likes this particular type of news, say, uh, you know, social science news. So he has a high alpha here. And um, 
you know, and then he uses, he doesn't use an aggregate assay, and his technology has a particular, you know, if he uses, spends one unit of time on discovering social science news, he's going to uncover so many articles, right? That's this stuff here, right? He's going to uncover it in his case because he doesn't use the aggregator, he's going to uncover it through search, through direct, through social. That's going to be how he spends one unit of time, how one unit of, of Matt's time is transformed into social science news, right? And this here determines how much of his time he's going to spend on social science news. Right? And the beauty of Cobb Douglas is that you can sort of separate those two things, right? Cobb Douglas tells you this is how much time you're going to spend. And then, you know, your technology is going to like tell you how, how efficiently you transform that time into actual output. Yeah. Yep. So is the efficiency in this model, it's topic specific? Is that right? Am I interested? Yeah, so for each, yeah, exactly. So, um, so like, you know, some of the things we're looking at are things like, you know, it's also like, you know, do you like breaking news, non-breaking news, okay? And so, you know, the, you know, for example, you might think that the aggregator is particularly good in uncovering breaking news, but not so good in uncovering non-breaking news, okay? So, yeah, yeah. I know you said you didn't have the, the content, but I'm wondering how much of this is due to... to the so current. we actually did, we did post-scrape the content, okay, we just so didn't pre-scrape it. Okay. Because I, I just wonder how much this is related to just the herding of, of the news. Like, so if everyone's just writing the same article, then yes. I just don't need to view that many things, right? Uh, like, if, if there was more variance in what people were reporting, then maybe I do need an aggregator to, like, kind of go through and see the spread. But if everyone's writing the same article, just typing in Donald Trump once or whatever would get me everything I need because everyone is writing the same exact story. That's, that's true. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, 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 that's true. I mean, the, if you have like breaking news, for example, like, you know, that's new news, you know, news that just came out, you know, like a few minutes ago, you really want to sort of be on the cusp of what's happening, right? I mean, then, then sort of the aggregator is very good in, in uncovering that. Um, you know, I mean, to what extent, um, yeah, I mean, for example, you might think like, you know, if you're particularly interested, like, you're interested in Donald Trump, you know, I mean, Maybe, maybe people don't have a high demand on that, you know, uh, in having this, this variety, but I mean, you would think that an aggregator is very good in like finding lots of this stuff quickly, right? Uh, same with uh, the search. Um, yeah, so, so I don't think I answered your question. So, uh, um, I mean, what this pie is just saying is like, you know, there's a, there's a particular way in which, you know, how quickly with or without the aggregator you discover news about Trump, right? I mean, you spend one unit of your time on this, how quickly you discover news articles on this. Um, if, you are, if you're only interested in reading one of those, right, <coughs> then, then basically your alpha wouldn't be very high on that. Right? Because you might read one article and that's it, right? I'm wondering like, whether there's just only one article. Like, I'm just thinking like, like like financial <coughs> economists, right? Like uh, a lot of people heard in their in their estimates, right? And so I don't need to read everyone's estimate if everyone's just telling me the same story. So I'm I'm wondering how much of it is a function of the news is just bad at what they do, and so it's not anything to do with the aggregator because they're they're just not telling different stories. They're just all trying to put out the same story, mm -hmm. the same way. Right. Um, yeah. So we can't totally look at this because I mean we, we do classify you know things by topic so we do have like for example um, financial news we do have things like foreign news you know particular corruption scandals and so on and you know we just see for example some people really like reading about particular corruption scandals you know and they have a high alpha they spend a lot of time reading it you know? um, so you know I guess I guess if these if they would be satisfied reading one and then switching you know that would show up in them having a low alpha. But we don't have a good theory of like, you know, why some people have a high alpha, some people have a low alpha. I mean, it's just basically, it's whatever the data tells us. So if you have like a user who like, you know, at that time there was like Ebola in Spain, okay? Uh, so Ebola, you know, there were some people who were spending a lot of time reading about Ebola in Spain. So these people would be matched to a control user, you know, who also reads a lot about Ebola in Spain. We don't have a good theory of like, you know, why do you like reading about Ebola in Spain? All we do is we just mash them to somebody who has similar consumption pattern. That's all. Okay? Uh, but we don't try to explain why they, why they read so much Ebola. 
you know, by other people are fine reading one article and then they spend the rest of the time reading about football and then they read you know half an hour about football. I mean, we just take it what it is. We just match them, you know, but we don't try to explain here where it comes from. I mean, what helps us is that that you know there's there's just this you know we have millions and millions of users and so we can we can match every user fairly cleanly to a controlled user who does similar stuff. Yep. Just sorry to keep pressing on the point, but um, wouldn't the aggregator interact with that somewhat? So um, perhaps you, as a user, would want to have more spread of variety. The aggregator allows you to see that spread, mm -hmm. but without it, you wouldn't think that there is spread in the news, and so you may not browse as much or as deeply. So. Yes. Yes, you're right. So, so basically, so then if you match based on those characteristics, then there's still a difference because the aggregator might just surface one thing. Yeah. So, so okay, fine. So what we have is, uh, so one of one of our characteristics we have is basically people who like, you know, we call it scarcity. You know, there's some people who like scarce news news which is not very well covered by the newspapers they usually read. So it turns out that when you look at the aggregator, these users, I mean the aggregator uncovers much more scarce news. Okay? So the aggregator is much better in, un in uncovering scarce news. Um, and <coughs> this type of news consumption is the one that suffers the most with the shutdown. Okay? So like basically if you compare, you know, tilde is with the aggregator and without a tilde is without the aggregator, you know? So the aggregator is much more efficient in uncovering scarce news, okay? And uh, without the aggregator, it's less efficient, okay? Now, uh, so, you, you know, the people who are most affected by that would be the people who have a high alpha for scarce news, okay? Okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so we, 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 we do have that in there, right? I mean, you would expect that you know, you know. As I said before, like you know, having the so the biggest, you know, the biggest impact. I mean, the in certain types of news, like scars news, the shutdown of the of the aggregator has a big effect on the pie, and that's going to affect the people the most who have a big alpha for this type of news, right? So there are some other people who like just read like you know five topics, you know, or just read the sports news or whatever. And they don't care about the rest. Yeah. And the shutdown is going to affect them less, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. Other question? Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the matching here. Um, so we have uh, we have the treatment users, the former Google News users, doing this matching period, which is after this adjustment period. And we have this vast set of potential controls. Okay. So we cannot just compare all the potential controls because the potential controls are very different. Right? So we have to like, you know, be very careful in selecting a set of, of control users who are similar to these uh, former Google News users. And so the proximity score we're using is based on the following uh, six ingredients. So it's total page views, news page views. So total page views is everything, including Facebook, etc. Okay? Um, news page views is how many landing pages and articles do you consume? Okay. Uh, news article page views, because when you when you consume news articles, there are landing pages, NewYorkTimes.com, and the particular articles. Right. When I say landing page, I mean both the home page, but also like you know there are subsequent landing pages, which are like the business landing pages, etc. All of these are landing pages. Um, then the articles access to search. Yeah. We also um, so we also equalize that. Um, how much you care about breaking news? So this is news that is consumed, you know, uh, within two hours after publication. And how much hard news you would like to consume? <coughs> this is everything excluding celebrity news and sports. Okay. And to do that, what we do is we we classify our newspaper articles. We use, I'll tell you a little bit about this at the end. We use Wikipedia to basically assign a topic to each newspaper article. And then we, we have like 500 topics 
and we classify those 500 topics into, into um, hard news and non-hard news, okay? And this is how we develop this. And um, okay, so then what we do is we do for each of these for each of these dimensions, we calculate the percentile rank for each user distribution, and for each potential control, we calculate their percentile rank in the distribution. Then we take the absolute difference. We just sum those up. Okay. What we try to do is we try to sort of find. We use a random serial dictatorship, so we try to like find the best control user, but we don't. You know, it's without replacement. Okay? So we don't use the control user again. And that's how we um, uh, that's how we, how we find the control users, and uh, you know, the it worked well enough for us to just use equal equal weights, so we didn't do anything beyond that. Okay, I mean, you could pr probably like you know, there would be a statistical way of like improving this by, by using sort of more sophisticated weights, but we just did the simple thing and it worked well enough for us. And I think what helped us here is because we just had this vast variety of uh, we had a vast number of potential control users. So even the random serial dictatorship didn't really matter so much because we didn't have a lot of uh, uh, reuse. Okay? We didn't really have a lot of conflict there. Do you have any questions about that? So this is what we matched on. Okay? And so here is like, you know, the differences between these control and treatment users. Um, so each row alternates between uh, treatment and control. Okay? And uh, then we have median, mean, standard deviation, and you know we do, you know, all these statistics are within sort of five percent, so they're all very, very close to each other. <coughs> and you know, in subsequent slides, I'm going to show you how they match on dimensions which we didn't match on, and they also match very well on those other dimensions. Okay, so. So here is news consumption over time. So what I'm showing you here is um, this is the this are dates. Uh, this is the time of the Google News shutdown. Okay. Then there's three weeks of uh, adjustment, and then there's the matching period. Right. So by construction, you know the treatment and control users. So treatment is um, uh, is red, and control users are blue. Those guys are going to be close together here. Right. But they're also close together here, right? So whatever like adjustment happens seems to have happened pretty fast. But here's before the shutdown, and you see here this big, big difference. Okay? <coughs> so you see here that these uh, Google News users—I mean, the, the, the Google News users here—consumed a lot more news than the non-Google News users. Right? Yeah. Just the dips are weekends. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, so these are the referral shares. Uh, so, so this is basically, uh, so what we did here is we, we had the browsing screen, and then what we, what we, what we did is we sort of we, we, um, sequenced, we sequenced the browsing stream into what we call news mini sessions. So the news mini session is the entry point, which is search or direct navigation. And then after you directly navigate or search or you come from Facebook, you go through a bunch of articles, right? And then you stop, okay? That's what we call a news mini session. Okay. So news mini sessions on average are like three or four articles long. Okay. They always have an entry point, and they typically stay within the same publication. So typically people don't switch from like say New York Times to Wall Street Journal. I'm saying U.S. publications, even though it's Spain, so it would be El País and you know something else, right? Um, okay. So what you can see is uh, the control users and the treatment users afterwards are are well matched. They're fairly close together on uh, search, direct, and other. Uh, for the control users, you don't really see a big difference. Right? You wouldn't expect because their technology didn't change. And for the treatment users, you see here what's happening is, um, you know, Google News by you know obviously goes down from like about 24% to zero. Okay, and they replace that by more direct navigation, somewhat more search. Okay. And other stuff doesn't really change so much, okay? Right? So other would include social 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 navigation. Okay. 
So most of the Google, I mean, most of the most of the most of the aggregator goes into search and direct. Okay. But one third goes into search, two thirds goes into direct navigation. All right, now we can use this model and we can just basically compare, um, we, com we can compare the total, the total uh, newspaper articles uh, that the treatment and the control users browse, okay? And, you know, if we do this across all news types, then basically uh, this, this, this sort of, the, the, what, what, what comes, you know, what falls out here is the tau t, so the seasonal effect goes away. So the seasonal effect goes away, um, and we essentially have sort of a similar distribution. I mean, the, by construction, the, the alphas here and the alphas here are the same, they have the same distribution, and the tau i's are also the same, okay? So even though they have a hat, you know, the, the, the axis, the matching axis size should have equalized those two things. So basically what we are comparing is the efficiency of the aggregator technology and the non-aggregator technology weighted by the consumption pattern of the users, right? Okay. Consumption pattern of the Google News users here. Okay. So later on, we're going to look at the same ratio, but we're going to do it within news types. If you do it within news types, so this is within a C, then actually all of this stuff falls away. It's kind of nice. Because then basically the consumption, say, of breaking news or scarce news essentially is just a it's just a ratio of these pies. Okay? But if we look at the total news consumption, then uh, it's it's sort of the relative efficiency of the aggregator versus the non-aggregator technology weighted by the consumption shares. Okay, so here's the main result. So so the way you interpret this is basically 20% is uh, when you, so this is, this is comparing the news consumption of treatment control users before the shutdown, okay? So the thought experiment here is, what would happen if I would give you an aggregator and you haven't used an aggregator before? Then your consumption goes up by about 20%. Now some of this consumption, a lot of this consumption actually is just Google News pages directly. So if I, if I exclude Google News homepages, then it still goes up by 10%. Okay. And uh, it goes up in terms of like you know the biggest increase is you read more articles. You also read somewhat more land. You know you read somewhat you read somewhat fewer landing pages if you take out the Google News landing pages. But you read a lot more articles. Okay. Yeah. So I, I take you know let's say these two halves of the room are the same. You know you have similar preferences. I match you up. And now, you know, I suddenly give you an aggregator, right? Then, then you guys are going to, like, consume fewer landing pages, more Google News landing pages, but fewer landing pages of Wall Street Journal, etc. but many more articles, right? And overall, your news consumption here would go up by about 20%. Yeah. Um, so I, I seem, and intuitively, um, I, I totally buy this. I think that this complementary story, but I have a question about the mechanism and then how that corresponds to your identification strategy. Because imagining just this is not social science, this is my intuition, um, that if I have a news aggregator, my preferences start to change. If I get in the habit of consuming breaking news, then I start to care more about breaking news. Yes. And well, it's it's hard for me to understand how if you if your preferences stay completely constant um, yeah. throughout this period of time, yes. that the extra step, if you like, really, really care about breaking news, the fact that you no longer have a Google News aggregator is just okay. going to keep okay. you so, so let me tell you how we, so let me tell you how it fits into this model, okay? So let's say that you really like breaking news, okay? If you really like breaking news, you're more likely in the first place to use an aggregator, because aggregators are good in uncovering breaking news, okay? You start using it, right? Now, it's much, you know, it's much more efficient. Your new technology is much more efficient in turning one hour of your time into lots of breaking news articles, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we would see that your consumption of breaking news is increasing hugely, okay? Now, we don't think, I mean, we don't, 
you know, it's not part of this model to think that also like, you know, your preferences for breaking news have increased, right? Your consumption has increased not because your preferences have changed, but because your technology has become much more efficient, okay? So that would be captured in this way, right? Um, and, you know, and, and we would have, if you are the treatment user, you know, you use Google News before already, we would have matched you with somebody who is similarly excited about breaking news, except that he or she hasn't started using yet Google News or the aggregator, okay? Maybe because, you know, they had no friend who told them that an aggregator is good at uncovering that. So how do the control people then get their bill of Google News if, if oh, they, they don't they have also sufficient need, technology? You know, if, if you are the kind of alpha who likes breaking news, okay, you're going to read more breaking news than another control user who has a lower alpha, okay? But uh, you're going to read less than a user with the same preferences who has access to the aggregator. Okay? But that's because your technology is worse. Okay? So, so, so the thing is like, you know, it's, 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 it's like, I guess as an economist sort of the, if I see somebody, you know, something changes, they use a different technology, okay? And they suddenly start doing something a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. Then my first inclination is not to think that their preference has changed. But my first inclination is to think that the preferences are the same because we think, as economists, usually as preferences, something relatively stable. But your technology has become better in doing this particular thing. Okay. So it's just um, it's just a separation of like you know preferences and technology. If we don't believe that, you know, then the separation doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But it's a useful separation, you know, because it makes it it makes it meaningful to the matching at a time that the technology is the same and then go back to a time when technologies differ. And then you can attribute those differences to the technology, but not the preferences. And that's what we are doing here, right? I mean, we are, we are doing the matching at a time that the technologies are the same. And so we're creating two sets of users with the same preferences. And then we go to the pre-matching you know, pre period. Um, and then we see that these guys behave differently but we don't attribute it to the preferences because our assumption is the preferences stay the same. We attribute all of this to the technology. And you know, if, if both things are happening, then our identification isn't, isn't working, okay? But it's sort of a maintained approach, you know, to just assume that preferences are relatively stable. It's not that, I don't believe that, that they're not always, you know, I, I believe preferences can change, okay? But I mean, this is a period of like six months, you know, and I think, uh, I mean, to me, it seems plausible that the biggest change in that time was not that people change their preferences, but the technology changed. And so the key mechanism here is that efficiency gain that Google... Yeah, so, 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 yeah so basically, the, these 10%, okay? This 10% increase in use consumption. So this is just, literally just means that, you know, our treatment users consume 10% more, more news, excluding Google News homepages, right? Compared to the non-Google News users. And, uh, you know, we attribute all of this to the better technology of the aggregator and none of it to the, to the preferences because we argue that the preferences have been equalized. And, um, and I think, you know, I mean, just to repeat that, I, I think within that period we're looking at is a six-month period from October 2014 to March 2015. I mean, I, you know, I think it's a sort of defensible one. I mean, I, but I, I'm not saying you wouldn't have a point, but I, I just, I mean, for, for this for this thing to work, we need to assume that the preferences are the same. What changes the technology? Yeah. So I'm just wondering what's going on. So with the other, this is social media. And um, yes. So that's saying that Google News is increasing people's access to news through social media. Yes. Yeah, so the um, so the so the thing here is true. So the um, so this is this is. This is percentage-wise, okay? So this would mean that, like, you know, literally there's a 30% increase, okay, of other stuff, okay? Now, the thing is that other stuff is only, is only about 9% uh, or so of news consumption, okay? So, you know, we didn't spend too much time on that. So you can also reverse that if you change a little bit of the matching. Uh, it's just like, you know, the, the, the base is so low that, that we weren't so worried about that, okay? Uh, I mean, these results are very robust here. They don't really <coughs> no matter how you run it, okay? But uh, it's true that, you know, basically the other share sort of fluctuates around between 9 and 12%. Uh, 
and you know, um, we didn't. I mean, to, to really make more headway there, we would have to probably break it down more. But we didn't invest the time in that. Yeah. Why do you think the other on the, the far left, far right column? Why does the other the direct other content decline so precipitously? <coughs> Um, direct other content. Yeah, so okay, so the direct other content would be, so direct other content are things like videos. Um, so it's like you're spending so much more time on the news? So, 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 I mean, so this is basically, yeah, so, you know, so this essentially is like, you know, you are, um, yeah, because I, I think, I think that's partially because, you know, the, um, the aggregator is more likely to like you know uh, link to articles and fewer to these multimedia slideshows and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. It just it just I mean it just basically reflects part of the algorithm they use. But it's so it's you know if you go to Google News it's fa quite rare that they link to a video. It's much more likely that they link to a newspaper article. Including just to be clear, including slideshows or videos hosted yeah. by news companies. Yes. So 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 if you go to the New York Times, right? Or was, I mean, New York Times a lot of like you know also slideshows and yeah, stuff like that. Google you know? News does not link right, to that. Google News does not link to that, and so that would be behind that decline. Okay. We haven't checked this explanation, but I mean it's consistent so with that. You're that it's good for the hard news articles, not so good for other content. Yeah, if you're a video hater, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's true. Um, any other questions? So. Um, if you do dwell time, it's actually very similar. Dwell time is, is just how much time they spend on the page. Uh, dwell time has some problems just because IE is not great in, in capturing dwell time. But, um, so basically, Google News is a complement to overall news reading, but a substitute to landing pages. Okay? Makes sense. So landing, you know, switch Google News on landing pages go a little bit down by about 8%, but overall news consumption goes up, excluding all of Google News itself. Okay. Um, okay. Now this is interesting. Is it basically we compare the top twenty and the bottom twenty? Okay. So the top top twenty um, publishers and the bottom twenty publishers, and there you basically see a more nuanced view. So basically, for the top twenty, um, the overall effect is sort of a wash. Okay. So what happens is that for the for the top guys. Um, they lose landing pages. I mean, when Google News, you know, when, when, when Google News is shut on, they lose landing pages, but they gain articles. But but overall, there's very little change. And you might argue that actually they lose money this way because you know the more valuable advertising tends to be on the landing pages. So if you just care about that, it's probably bad for the big guys. For the small guys, um, you know, the small guys when Google News is shut down, they lose a ton of uh, ton of overall consumption. Um, Landing pages stay basically the same, but they lose tons of articles. So for the small guys, it's unambiguously negative. For the big guys, it's sort of a wash. And that sort of, you know, that kind of is consistent with the political economy of this whole thing, because, you know, what happened is that um, in Spain, for example, the big publishers were the ones pushing this, the top five in particular, okay? Yeah. Bell time is, again, very similar. Uh, so Google News is a very strong complement for small publishers, raises total news browsing by about 26%, but for the, for, the, for the big publishers, it's basically a wash. It changes the mix of landing page articles, but doesn't really um, change the volume. And, you know, whether you care about this, yes? So, so that's suggesting that uh, people in the absence of Google News are sort of Sticking to sort of the easy sites to get to. I can get to New York Times. I can yes, get yes, to, exactly. Have you actually looked at kind of the diversity, like uh, whether or not the the sources of news are less diverse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there is this, this exactly what's happening. So basically, it's like so. We looked at a couple of examples, like people, for example, looking at Ebola, doing Ebola research, you know, and essentially, like you know, before the shutdown, you know, they look at more diverse news sources. You know, they find these small guys publishing on this topic. And afterwards, it's just their, their usual publishers. Okay? So this is particular for these guys who are interested in these sort of scarce topics. Okay? For them, it's a big loss. Okay? Yeah, Which is I consistent with, with, with how you think aggregators are being used. Right. I wonder also if, I mean, this is sort of a, an extension thinking about in, in these sort of politically polarizing times, whether 
uh, we've thought about social media being kind of an echo chamber or creating an echo chamber, but it could be that aggregators are actually doing the opposite, which is increasing the diversity of opinions that people are reading from new sources. Yes, yes. So this is this is sort of a follow-up thing we're looking at, where we, you know, uh, so one thing, this is a little bit I wanted to talk about one of the tools, because, um, you know, one of the things that's, that sort of delayed this part of the project is, is that, uh, it's hard to sort of do um, opinion or to do bias classification at scale. So you can crowdsource it, but it's actually hard to do it at scale. And lots of people, and, and the things that have worked at scale are things more that people have done for like um, uh, understanding the bias of a particular news publisher rather than a news article. But what we would have to do is like, you know, look at sort of particular articles. You know, if I give you say two articles as a human, you can decide, oh, this is more pro-Trump, less pro-Trump, you know? But teaching that a machine is hard. And I, I thought there's a lot more progress, but there's actually... So this is some, one of the things we're working on, and because this is difficult. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so this paper kind of reminds me of um, the uh, car auction paper by uh, Steve Tadellis, where they like, you know, add more information to one group, and you can actually see more details about um, about the like how bad is the bad car and how good is the good car. Mm -hmm. um, and a surprising result is people are more willing to pay for even really bad cars if they get this information treatment where they can see you know, like exactly how bad it is. And that information increases their willingness to pay as opposed to uh, decreases at least, at least on average. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's an equivalent version here where um, like, do, like, like, does the aggregator help people find stuff they don't want to, or, um, or, or, like, are there any losers to the aggregators because they, they're just, you know, they're just no, they help them filter out stuff they don't want. Um, basically, did, did, you know, other than big and small, are there heterogeneous treatment effects on publishers in terms of quality or, 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 or topic? That's super interesting. Yeah, we haven't, yeah, so... That, that, yeah, short answer is like we thought about that, but we haven't done anything on it. Because, um, yeah, I mean, we looked, you know, we looked at the topic distributions, and they capture a little bit like, you know, about, you know, the, the sports magazines, you know, versus sort of the hard news publishers, you know. But really, in terms of, I mean, you would have to really get closer to quality, and we haven't, we haven't done that. So the, the, the short answer is no, we haven't, yeah, it's something we would be interested in, but we haven't done. And then beyond the scope of this project. But I agree, it's an interesting question. Um, so let me just tell you here about the, um, um, uh, you know, sort of the second part of the paper, which basically looks at the, at the volume effect by type. Uh, so, you know, in the first part, we just look at the total volume. But now, you know, we can look at particular types of news, scarce news, for example. Okay, non-scarce news or breaking news, non-breaking news. And you can see, like, you know, what what is the particular impact of these aggregators for these particular news categories? Okay, so um, so these sort of are the the news characteristics here we look at. Um, so one is breaking news. So is something published within a few? You know, these are news articles which are very recent versus the older ones. Um, something which we call scarcity. And, you know, there are two notions here of scarcity. One is sort of absolute scarcity. There might be some topics which are sort of, there aren't many articles relative to the interest in this, in this topic, okay? Um, but then there's also sort of, this is absolute scarcity. There's also relative scarcity, which is basically, um, you know, if I read the USA Today, I, I'm relatively scarce of finance news because USA Today doesn't have as many articles on finance. If I'm reading the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, I'm relatively scarce on sports news, okay? Because, you know, the Wall Street Journal has a lot of stuff on, on, on finance, but doesn't have as much sports news, okay? So basically, depending on what sort of my usual set of publishers are, I might be scarce or not scarce on particular topics, okay? So there's two notions of scarcity. And, um, you know, I don't really have the time to sort of go into I mean, the paper has the, has the formal definition of that, but... Uh, uh, intuitively, these are the two notions of scarcity. Okay? So there's scarcity, absolute scarcity, and relative scarcity. Okay? And there's popular news. 
So top, you know, top five articles versus non top five articles. This is how we define it. And there's hard news, which is basically not celebrity or sports news. Okay. So these are sort of the um, these are sort of the characteristics of news we looked at. Okay. And you know, they're, they're, each of them is like you know one, two, three, four. Um, well, actually, scarcity is there's absolute and relative scarcity. You see, there's two, so there are five dimensions. And so there are two to the five cells, if you want, okay? Because there is like scars, there's breaking scars news, breaking non-scars news, etc. So there are two to the five cells, okay? 32 cells. So 32 types of news. And so this, each type of news is basically one of the C's in the model, okay? And so I don't have time to go through that. But, you know, the, you know, remember that we didn't, you know, except for breaking news, we didn't match on any of these other dimensions. But our control and treatment users are actually very close on each of these dimensions, okay? Both if you look at these dimensions overall, and also if you look at the 32 cells, okay? So equality is only rejected in two out of these 32 tests, okay? So we, we, we're actually surprised by that, how well it worked. But basically, even though this is stuff we didn't match explicitly on, our users were very close on all of these, okay? Okay, so let's look at breaking news. So this is interesting here. Yeah? Um, so what do you see? Um, so this is, the, this is the search, you know, this is basically the, the volume um, of, of uh, volume of pages, and this is the publication hour. So for the, for the control users, basically you don't see a big difference before and after. And you also see that basically sort of the, 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 the most commonly consumed news is about three hours old, okay? Right? And you can also see here is for the, the treatment users after, you know, they're not that different from the control users. The pattern looks similar, but you can see that for the treatment users before, they consume much more recent news. Okay. The blip is much earlier. And you know, you can also see that this is coming from Google News. Okay? Because directly navigated news is on average. So directly navigated news is this red bar here, red graph. And you know, directly navigated news is on average older. Okay? So Google News is very, very recent. Yeah? And it's the it's it's the Google News one which basically pushes the, the recency of news for the treatment users before the shutdown towards early news. Okay. Yep. So clearly, like you know, the the the, I mean, that suggests that you know the aggregator is very effective in pushing, you know, in basically uncovering recent news, right? Because we know that otherwise these control and treatment users have, you know, by construction should have similar preferences for breaking news because we match them by breaking news consumption in the post period, right? So, so it's not the case that this difference here and here in this blue graph is driven by preferences because preferences are the same, right? We match these graphs to essentially be the same. So this goes back to your question about you know, technology of preferences. I mean, we argue that the difference between this and this is due to technology. All right, now, um, what about scarcity? So I mentioned this already. Um, the Google News is an important source of, of user scarce news. So what you, you know, what you navigate through Google News is on average much scarcer. So the topics you tend to read on Google News tend to be exactly the topics that are not supplied by your directly navigated news, okay? And um, this is the volume drop compared to the control and treatment users. And this is by our, by recency, by our publication, how old the news is. And red is scarce news, and blue is not scarce news, okay? And forget about the lightly shaded ones. I mean, forget about this for one second. So basically, what do you see here? Well, there's a, there's a general pattern that this is increasing here. So basically, the drop is much bigger for the breaking news than the non-breaking news, okay? So breaking news de declines more than non-breaking news, okay? Um, the other thing is that scarce news 
the red one declines more than the non-scarce leaves, okay? This is true basically for all of these bins, yeah? The scarce news is the one that, that declines the most. And, uh, you know, now I'll tell you about the, what, 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 what this is the mysterious counterfactual. So basically, the, um, the, the lightly shaded one would be the, would be, would be the, the, the change in consumption if you just take away the aggregator. So if you just take away Google News and nothing else happens, okay? So we just subtract the Google News page views for this particular class of views, but nothing else happens. And the non-lightly shaded one, the richly shaded one, is basically the actual, the actual decrease. And so, you know, what's the difference between those two? Well, like, you know, let's say that I use Google News. You take Google News away from me. So suddenly, like, you know, previously I had 1,000 page views which now disappear. That would be the lightly shaded one. But, you know, I can substitute to some extent. I can move it to, like, direct navigation or social or whatever. And so you, I wouldn't expect that my decrease is quite as serious, okay? I would actually expect that my, my decrease is less than, than, and you can see this here typically, it's less. So basically what you see here is that um, for, for, let's say, six to ten hours, the, this is the drop in news consumption for the, for the non-scarce news. That just happens if I take away the aggregator. I just subtract those page views. But you see that the actual drop is less because people substitute. They use other, they, they use other news sources, right? uh, search or direct. Um, but you know, they, cannot sub, but they essentially cannot substitute. Substitution is very low for the breaking news. Basically, there, the, the decrease in consumption is essentially just by taking away Google News. They almost cannot substitute anything away, okay? And it's also like, you know, they, they can substitute less for the, for, the, for the scarce one. The scarce news, they can substitute less. You can see this here, um, you know, for the scarce news, they can substitute somewhat, but not as well as they can substitute for the non-scarce news, okay? So for popular and hard news, um, you find similar, not quite a striking effects, but basically the uh, volume drop is, is stronger for, uh, for popular and hard news, okay? And um, we do a decomposition where we just basically decompose this into, into, um, into the various components. Um, so what we have is, you know, the, we just compare for treatment control users for each type of news, we compare their consumption of this type of news with and without the aggregator. And you know, the model is kind of useful here because basically all the demand parameters are sort of cancel away. So the only thing that remains is basically the effectiveness of the news technology, okay? Yeah, so that's nice. And you know, then we just sort of impose a particular functional form to estimate that. So basically, uh, you know, this, this number is generally bigger than one because the aggregated technology is more efficient than the non-aggregated technology. But it's going to be like, you know, uh, for example, like, you know, if, if, you know, so what this model basically assumes is that, um, you know, um, yeah, for example, here we find that uh, scarce news, the aggregator is 30% more efficient in uncovering that. And, uh, uh, for breaking news, it's 20% more efficient, okay? So what, the, what this would mean is, uh, nothing to write, but this would mean is basically that um, uh, if you look at the two bins, basically, uh, scarce news, which is breaking, versus non-scarce non news, not breaking, okay? The difference there would be 20% plus 30% would be 50%, okay? So this additive model, okay? okay? So it just basically decomposes the effects of scarcity, et cetera, breaking news, hard news, popularity into sort of an additive model, okay? And so you see that here, the, basically the, the, the aggregate is 30% more efficient for, for scarce news, 20% more efficient for breaking news, 10% more efficient for, for hard news, and 5% for popular news. And, you know, 
the constant is basically zero, which means that sort of you know this simple additive model explains most of that. Yeah. Uh, so do you think what's going on here is related to like interaction with people's underlying taste for these different kind of news, or is this something about how the algorithm inside the aggregator treats these different kinds of news? Well, this is, you know, so here, when estimating this, right, the demand falls out, right? So this is just pure technology, right? So there's, like, you know, this basically, I mean, if you take the model literally, this is just, you know, this is just basically like, you know, what this is saying is if you if you want to, if you're interested in uncovering breaking news, which is scarce, you know, the aggregator is 150% more efficient, 150% as efficient as the non-aggregator. And that's purely technological. So pushing it up. Yeah, they're pushing it up. I mean, like Google News has like, you know, the breaking news info boxes, right, has a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and they're just also very good in, in, in adapting to your preferences because usually you're logged in, right? And uh, as you logged in, you know, they, they learn about uh, what you're interested in, right? And uh, so this is sort of a side thing we have started to look at. We looked at who's actually logged in and also, like, you know, whether they have, like, sort of custom sections on the left-hand side uh, because we can see that to some extent. It's not perfect, but that would be sort of how the aggregator learns about this, you know, your, your preferences, right? Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so essentially, like, you know, the, what the decomposition shows is that, that breaking news, user scarcity are sort of the two most important factors in explaining the volume drop, okay? Because the aggregator is so efficient for uncovering these two types of news, breaking news and scarce news. And uh, so that's how these two things fit together. Um, so let me tell you, uh, about sort of three, three sort of follow-up projects, and then sort of two tools. I wanted to spend a bit more time on that, but let me just tell you, tell you quickly about those. Um, so one is um, uh, sort of one, one project looks at social news consumption, you know, because we've seen over time in our data, and you know, many people have seen this, obviously, is that, that referrals from Facebook in particular have increased, right? And so the question there is, um, you know, does that change? Um, you know, does it change the kind of news you consume? Okay, and you know, it, you know, if you just look at the raw browsing stream, it looks very different. It looks like you know, uh, the raw browsing stream of social news is full of people who consume social news is full of you know, me, you know, celebrities and other things. You know, um, so you might think, well, that you know, maybe maybe our news consumption, in, you know, is more pushed towards those things when we when we um, when we introduce. Uh, uh, when, we, when we move to aggregators. But it turns out, I mean, social news, but it turns out that actually, if you control for the user, decom user composition, this effect goes away. What I mean by that is that the people who consume a lot of social news are also younger people, okay? People who might have, like, at least for a while, a more high intrinsic interest in these things, okay? So if you look at within a user, I take one user, and I see this user over time as he or she consumes more social news. It turns out that, you know, the amount of, say, crime news or foreign news, etc., they consume is actually relatively stable. It doesn't change much. Okay. Another way of saying is, if I take a user and I see, like, you know, the user has, say, 300 pages, uh, page views, 100 page views, say, 150 page views on social media, 150 page views are through direct navigation. It turns out that those 150, if you if you look at them by topic, they actually don't look that different. That surprised us, okay? The reason why the raw browsing stream looks different is just because, you know, the, the people who use social media are different, okay? But the implication of this, if, it's, if it holds, is basically saying that if I'm the Wall Street Journal and I see more people reading, you know, switching from direct navigation to social navigation, do I have to, like, hire, say, more, do I have to change my, do I have to change sort of my, my sections? Do I have to bulk up my, my movie section? Do I have to bulk up other sections? And the answer is, it would be, at least in a broad sense, no, okay? However, within topics, there are interesting differences. Because we crowdsourced also like articles, and it turns out that the articles that are read through social are almost in all dimensions, they're more emotional, more opinionated, more biased, okay? So within, within a topic, basically, you see these stark differences in types, okay? So you see that, you know, 
So, so it does have implications. It doesn't mean that you know you have to hire more movie reporters or whatever, but it does mean that maybe you want to hire a certain type of reporters who have a more opinionated article, who write from the ego perspective or who do other things. Okay, and so it might change like the way we consume news, but maybe not 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 in topics. Yes. So I don't, I don't know like what your empirical strategies here, but. Is it possible that folks who use social media more might change the type of news that they look at through direct navigation? So I see uh, topic-wise. So you didn't see any difference in the topics, but it could it have been that uh, you know once you start using Facebook, you see a lot of stuff about a certain topic, and then you decide to, you become interested in it, you start searching for it directly. Also, it could be. It could. I mean, so you haven't looked at this specifically. I, I think a lot of it's not is again it's not because of. It's not because of a change in preferences. I think it's because of just what's supplied. You know? Right. And what people share is just tends to be this. tends to be that stuff. You know. Yeah. I mean, it could also be that by the same token, you know, you consume very different news. You know, because maybe people share. You know, even though you like a lot of foreign news, that's not what people share. But that doesn't seem to happen. Okay. But within topics, it seems to happen that people people consume more of that stuff. So so you know, so this is this is one topic we're working on. Okay. Um. um you know, you also see, you know, you see, we, we find this, some evidence of echo chamber effects. So basically, conservatives read even more conservative articles within the within the thing. Um, you know, other thing we're looking here at is is uh, looking at the impact of um, um, so basically agenda setting. You know, newspapers set agendas uh, in terms of like how they rank news. Okay, so what's on top, what's at the bottom. Now, to, su to some extent, you know, these agendas just reflect preferences of their readers, right? But they might also have an independent effect, okay? Um, that, you know, so, so one view might be that, you know, if, so basically what we're interested in is like, uh, if you are, say, a Huffington Post reader who is forced to read Breitbart, um, presumably, you know, I mean, you could like sort of consume news exactly in the same amount as before, right? It would take you an awful lot of time to find all the Hillary news you know, in, in Breitbart. But I mean, you could, like, you know, if you search long enough, you could probably, like, approximate your view share you have on, on Huffington, okay? But it's much harder because of the agenda setting of Breitbart, right? And so what we're interested in is basically separating preferences from the agenda setting, okay? And what we have for this is sort of we have, we have been scraping for about three years, about 2,000 newspapers, and for about 109 of them, the most important ones, we scrape them every 30 minutes. And we have, you know, we actually know exactly like how the homepage, you know, how the, how the headlines, everything changes within sort of these 30 minutes intervals, okay? So if you're interested in this kind of data, apart from the browsing data, this is actually sort of, you know, interesting data set. Okay? Um, because it's, it's, it's much more detailed than what you would get, say, from the, from the Internet Archive or so. Because it's, it's very, very high frequency. And we also have like font size um, and uh, font size and the position, the X, Y position of the headline. So we know pretty much the structure of the, the page and we know how it changes in these 30 minute intervals. Okay? So this is this project. And then uh, with David Rothschild from, from New York City, uh, MSR New York City, we have, uh, we have a project. And Duncan Watts also joined. It's basically about trying to understand, um, you know, especially if you read Breitbart. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this a lot recently. And, um, you know, a lot of Breitbart news is actually, it's true also for Huffington, is, is, based, on, is based on agency reports, okay? So you, you open this news article, you read it, it's almost 90% is agency, okay? The big difference is, the big difference is, is again, is agenda setting. If you compare Huffington and Breitbart, they, they you prioritize news very differently. The second thing is the headline is very different, okay? And then they do add some original content, okay? Uh, they also like selectively take agency articles. I mean, you know, they don't fully copy all the AP text. They might take the part that's sort of, you know, more uh, biased towards Trump or less, you know, less positive for Hillary. Or, you know, I mean, there, there are these things happening as well. But basically, what we want to understand is how much of the how much of the bias comes from agenda setting versus headlines versus original content. Okay. So what we are essentially doing is across a wide variety of newspapers, we are we are sort of, uh, uh, you know, say like, you know, some, 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 you know, three months ago, Trump had this sort of uh, contentious phone call to the Australian Prime Minister. So we look at all these articles, right? And then we see how much do they differ in terms of the headline, in terms of the, the content that was added by every particular site, how much of that is, is common, 
AP. And, uh, you know, and then we crowdsource to see like how much do these components matter in terms of bias. Okay? So this is, this is this project. And it uses this uh, uh, data we have been collecting on, on uh, the browse, browse data. And uh, you know, just two tools, you might be interested in this, we have a lot of code for this. One is uh, topic discovery. So we use Wikipedia for like, you know, discovering topics. And the reason why we use Wikipedia is because we need something that's very stable over time. So we don't use like, you know, standard topic models because we want really, you know, we want really a topic that we can, we can compare 2013 and 2017, okay? Also what we often do is we, we crowdsource within topics to sort of find out, say, political bias. It's much easier to crowdsource if you show like a crowd, you know, if you show a worker all the articles about a particular topic, okay? So you really want human, I mean, you want really topics which are intelligible by humans. And so, so we found Wikipedia very, very useful. And we have a lot of code for doing that. And so if you're interested, it's, com it's, it's described to some extent in the, in, the, in the aggregator paper at the appendix. And you know, I'm happy to also talk about that. And you know, bias classification, I talked briefly about this in the last slide, is, is basically the uh, it's work in progress. And you know, bias classification is difficult. Um, it's important for many topics, um, for, many, for many questions we want to answer. And you know, like you know, you're probably familiar with the Gensko Shapiro approach to uncovering bias, which basically looks at how how people in um, you know how how congressional Republicans and Democrats talk, and then basically uses that to sort of see like you know what you know how does the Wall Street Journal, how does the New York Times talk, and sort of attribute bias. Now it turns out this works quite well on the on the publisher level, but it works very poorly on the article level. And you know, our intuition is that the reason why it works poorly at the article level is because, um, because essentially, it's sort of you, what you what you're really uncovering a topic distribution. So essentially, if I tell you this publication is 30% gun control, 20% on Planned Parenthood, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, you can make a very good informed decision that this is a conservative magazine. Okay? On the other hand, if like you know, this, this magazine, this, you know, this, this news, you know, if the topic distribution is different, you can make another decision, okay? So the topic distribution tells you a lot. So it's much easier to classify things on the publisher level, because essentially the topic distribution is sufficient, but it's much harder to classify on the article level. So if I give you within a particular topic, say, Trump, Australian Prime Minister, and then I want you to sort of basically decide what's pro and pro, I mean, what is, what is Republican, what is Democrat, it's very hard to do that, okay? Very, very hard. And so what many people do is they just basically try crowdsource it, okay? And crowdsourcing is fine, but it doesn't work so well if you have like this long tail of newspaper articles. It's unfortunately the case that, you know, even if you crowdsource 20,000 articles, which is quite expensive, you know, you still cover only a tiny share of all the newspaper articles out there. It's a very, very long tail. So it makes it hard. So the two approaches we looked at is basically thinking about sort of bias as a sort of, you know, two-dimensional thing, sentiment times topic. If I tell you a particular article about, say, tax cuts, you know, it's favorable to tax cuts, quite likely it's uh, Republican. Now, this works sometimes, it doesn't always work. So the second approach we looked at, which has some independent interest, is basically measuring direct and indirect quotes by, by politicians in text, okay? And that's much more doable, actually. So essentially what we're doing is we, we're writing this, this entity classifier, which basically identifies, you know, all the Republican and Democratic politicians talking in newspaper articles. Within a newspaper article, you can use heuristics. For example, Barack Obama said, he said, he said. So he is really Barack Obama. You can use that logic to basically identify all the speech by Barack Obama. And then you can um, use sort of, you know, you can, you can create a, a graph, a co-occurrence graph. This essentially captures like, you know, Barack Obama, President Obama, etc. So you find out that basically these two entities, Barack Obama and President Obama, are the same thing. We use modularity for that, which works quite well. And then, um, uh, you know, once we have that, we go back to the article and we basically measure what share of, of, of the content is basically quoting one side or the other side. Okay? And we hope to use that for bias classification, but we also think it might have some independent interest to just know, like, you know, which facts from which side are presented by how much. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I work on bias, um, media bias, and thought about some of this. Have you ever thought about um, 
creating a bias classifier from the user information. So like user browser history, if a user goes on shops a lot for guns, and then goes visits a website, then you know, that, that publisher is probably... Yeah, yeah, so there's, yeah, so, so, so yeah, there, there, there's some approaches you can using, for example, uh, Twitter, you know, and they use basically like, you know, collaborative filtering, something like this, some ideas like that. Um, but what I've seen is they use it on, I mean, so I, I've seen, you know, people apply this to, to, to basically, uh, again, publishers. So there's this sort of collaborative filtering approach applied to publishers. On so articles, um, I think, I, I'm not sure how well it's going to work on articles because I'm not sure, like, for example, on Twitter, you know, how many, you know, how many, how many mentions of these articles would you get? I mean, you would need enough volume to actually do this well. So I can, I can see, I, I can see the basic idea working very well on the publisher level because you have enough volume. But, uh, uh, I mean, the data source we would, we would have to use, the only data we would have access to is the Twitter network. I mean, at, at Microsoft we have access to the Twitter firewalls. And, uh, but, you know, the Twitter, I work with Twitter data and it just doesn't cover enough news articles at a high enough frequency so that you would get a good enough signal for a particular article. So the New York Times publishes like, you know, about 1,000 articles a day, depending on how you count it. Uh, you don't have, you know, you only have a signal from a small number of these articles. So that, that, that's a problem. So if you aggregate them up on the New York Times scale or Wall Street Journal scale, then this approach works quite well. And there are, there are papers doing, doing this collaborative filtering approach. But I, 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 you know, I haven't seen these papers on the, on the article level. My intuition is it would be hard just given the volume. So I went over time. I started five minutes ago, but still went over time. So sorry about that. Um, but that's basically uh, it. And if you have, um, you know, if you email me, it's always at Microsoft.com or you go to my website, it has the contact information. Um, and if you want to, you know, ask about how to get access to either Microsoft data or like the second data sources, the scrape data, which we have, okay, then I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, the, the scrape data is really, um, I mean, I, I, the scrape data I think is, is basically including all the big U.S. publishers and all the big European publishers. And it starts in about, starts in August 2014, goes until now, and we, we continue that every day. And uh, uh, basically what it has is it's a differential scrape that has the news articles published. Um, the way we do that is we, we look at the landing pages. We have a set of landing pages for each publisher. These are like, you know, NewYorkTimes.com, NewYorkTimes slash business and so on. These landing pages are updated over time. And then we, we just basically see the new articles here being published. And we look at the positions. Okay? And then also every day or every 30 minutes, depending on the, on the size of the publisher, we, we, we code sort of the status of the home page. Okay? And so uh, I think this is a particularly interesting data set now because over time, this is gonna, it's become, it's gonna become harder to do because newspapers are going to like customize their home page depending on the user. So at least for the period we looked at, this hasn't happened as much yet. Okay? So there is like, you know, the most read section and so on, or like a local section depending on where your zip code is, which is customized in many cases. But for most newspapers, you know, they haven't yet customized their, their home page depending on the user. It's not like Google News yet, okay? So once this is starting, this is gonna make a lot of things harder because then you basically have to content with the algorithm and the supply of news, okay? So, so we have this two data, two, two years of data which is relatively free of that, okay? So if you want to chat about that, I may have.